I'm James Milan, and this is Talk of the Town. We are delighted to welcome into our studio our state representative, Sean Garbley, who is here for a legislative update. We love to get these uh, as regularly as we can from our state legislators. So, as always, we appreciate your being here, Sean. Great Good to, to be you. here. Thanks, James. Thanks Good for having me. Um, so we, we also got to speak recently to our state senator, mm -hmm. Cindy Friedman. We talked about the budget, and, she, you know, it was interesting to me that she referred several times to it as being, hey, this is a good budget that we've got this year. And right. my interpretation of that was a good budget means there's money uh, to be spent on right. various programs. So mm -hmm. let's talk about where we're at uh, with, with the budgetary process right now. Right. Um, uh, because we've been hearing about this money, but we're not yet seeing it, I don't right. think. Um, and then any particular wins in that budget for Arlington or implications right. for Arlington? Let's start there. Great. James, thank you so much for, for hosting this. Thank you to ACMI. I always love coming and, and speaking to, to my constituents in Arlington and, and in, in West, West Medford. Medford yes, um, of course. So, so thanks so much for, for this opportunity. Uh, Senator Friedman and Representative Rogers, when they have come to, to speak to you, are absolutely correct in stating that this was a good budget. I serve on the House Ways and Means uh, Committee, so we're, we are the committee that crafts the budget every year. We have hearings across the Commonwealth to really understand what people's priorities are, really around Governor's House One, which is the Governor's budget. And so we hear from experts in housing, people with disabilities, mental health, economic development, housing every aspect of the budget that's crafted and then we craft our own budget in April the Senate crafts their own budget and then we do a final budget uh, and then the governor uh, can decide to line item veto and then we override aspects of the budget the governor did not veto any monetary item in the budget this year which I assume so, is another sign that there's a certain kind of financial health here. Well, there, there is serious financial health in the Commonwealth. Our revenues have increased uh, dramatically over the last six months. Uh, we're cautiously optimistic. Um, and because of that, we've been able to invest um, greatly in the Commonwealth. We invested strongly in everything from unrestricted general government aid to Chapter 70 education, which we'll talk about uh, soon, to McKinney-Vento, to Special Education Circuit Breaker. Because of the budget, uh, that the House and the Senate passed, the governor signed into law. Um, it, we did a commitment to K through 12 education, which was kind of the first payment of the Foundation Budget Review Commission's uh, recommendations on education in the Commonwealth that we're not adequately funding uh, education. And this has led to Arlington receiving $2 million more than last year, uh, which is Tremendous, and I think that's very, very significant. You know, I've been working, I think we've had numerous legislative updates over my time in office, and I've always appreciated your candor and, and how informed you are on issues pertaining to Arlington, and you have always raised to me the concern of the formula mm -hmm. and local aid. We and have so, talked about it many and times. And we've talked about it many times. Hardly <laughs> ever have we gotten to celebrate something, right? right? Um, and so this has been my priority as a member of the Ways and Means Committee, uh, making sure that we invest in local aid and increase our local aid for Arlington. Because Arlington is in a diff difficult situation, right? Because we don't have a lot of commercial development like a Waltham, like a Burlington. We are highly a residential tax base um, community. So our ability to raise revenue is very difficult and so the state needs to recognize that and I've always believed that when we do a formula it needs to take into account a community's inability to grow economically right mm -hmm. or, or residential or, or, or properties um, and so education is obviously our huge investment in the Commonwealth and so so important for the legislature to adequately fund that in the Commonwealth and we did a big step with this budget to be able to do that, mm -hmm. investing in all areas of education. So that was a huge win for Arlington. We also saw wins from, you know, funding for the Thompson, uh, Louisiana, Louisiana Field, mm -hmm. uh, the Thompson Park, everything from the, the Children's Room to AYCC. Um, to an increased amount of money in Chapter 90 for our roads so when and for you our bridges. Sir, 
Sorry to interrupt. When when you mention things like the children's room or AYCC, et cetera, are you talking about earmarks that are going, you know, directly to fund those particular programs and organizations? I am. So they're, they're items that I and Senator Friedman and Representative Rogers uh, filed as part of the budget mm -hmm. that we were able to get past. People would call them earmarks. I view them as um, local aid mm -hmm. because this is money coming directly from the state that will go to pay for a new park at Thompson Elementary School, services at AYCC for people throughout Arlington, right? Uh, services at the Children's Room, which obviously has a huge population, people from Arlington who adequately use those services. So I, I view those as local aid. I also received, because uh, West Medford obviously is very important to me as well, uh, money for the West Medford Community Center, which I know people in Medford and Arlington uh, use quite quite frequently. Right. So, you know, some people would call uh, these items pork. Um, I don't think anyone would say that going to the children's room is pork. Right. So I try to correct people, James, by, by making sure they're aware that this is local aid, that mm -hmm. this is money going directly to improving the quality of life for people in our community. To me, that's and that very is, important. Right. That's absolutely very good news. Um, I was wondering if you could dig down a little bit for us. Um, we know that we are getting this increase in education funding for Arlington, as you mentioned, and it's a significant one. Um, is, it, uh, is it directed toward, towards any particular aspects of the education that we're providing in town, or is it going into kind of general education funding? So that's a great question, and so let me dive into uh, what we just did and we did it through the budget process and we did it through the statutory process and right now uh, it is in uh, conference committee the education piece so you know as you know and we've talked about many times but just so your viewers uh, are aware of it many many years ago a number of us myself included filed uh, a commission to be created through legislation called the foundation budget review commission and what we wanted the commission to look at um, was what areas in education has the state walked away from its obligation. We know that through our Constitution the state has an obligation to fund public education in all 351 cities and towns. We wanted to know and we heard it from school committee members and select board members that uh, more of the cost of education was being forced on homeowners through property tax and localities like here in Arlington and they wanted us and quite frankly myself included as a forum member of the school committee and a co-sponsor of the commission review legislation to look at what specific areas has the state not been meeting its obligation and how can we get the state to meet its obligation so the report came back this was done five years ago the commission's report came back and it looked at four specific areas from the cost of health care for municipal employees to special costs of special education the biggest ticket item one of those aspects was the cost of low income, educating low income populations across our state, and the cost of educating English language learner students across our state. So those four areas came to a total of about $1.5 billion every year that the state was not adequately funding. That's important. So we created the implementation, uh, it's called the Student Opportunity Act, where we want the state to adequately fund public schools in Massachusetts, or at least to what the commission's report mm -hmm. stated. I always believe that we need to do better, but this legislation passed both in the Senate and by the House takes tremendous steps as a former school committee member to move us in that direction. And what it calls for is an expenditure of $1.5 billion in new money, in new investment over the next seven years. Mm -hmm. So if you did, um, you know, the, the bill is currently in conference committee, so I don't have exact numbers of what Arlington will receive. But if you look at, uh, you know, the status quo, meaning if we did nothing to the Opportunity Act, Arlington between now and 2027 could see upwards to four to five million more dollars in in funding which is tremendous mm -hmm. and and as you know Arlington is not low income we don't have a large ELL population so our portion of the Student Opportunity Act will mainly come from health care reimbursement from the state and special education 
And part of the piece of special education, James, was we included uh, out-of-district transportation costs to be included in the calculation for the special education circuit breaker. And that's incredibly important because if you talk to Superintendent Bodie, she here in Arlington, she will tell you that one of the greatest costs is out of district costs for special education. I support those costs because obviously we want those students to get the best education possibly. And most of the time that education can't be done in house. It has to be done, you know, out of town to make sure those students okay, get so the education they need. But part of that education funding is the transportation cost and the state has been making the town pay for it for years. Now, because of this bill, if it comes out of conference included, we'll uh, take, we'll invest a number of those costs. Yeah, and I just wanted to state. clarify, probably don't need to, but just for my, my own sake, that when you're talking about out of, out of district transportation costs, what you mean is that there are special education students who live in Arlington, Correct. but need services that they that need that that are not available in town. Therefore, they need to go somewhere else for those, and therefore they need to be transported as uh, a result. And we've been shouldering that. As absolutely, a town. absolutely. And you know, we want these students to go out of town. Quite frankly, in my opinion, because we don't have the programs that fit those students' needs, mm -hmm. um, and we want to make sure that students in Arlington who need services out of district get the services they need you know that's really really important but the cost of that should be um, not burdened by the taxpayers here in Arlington or by the school committee but it should be done by the state mm -hmm. and so that's something I've been working um, very long on so I'm really happy that it's in the bill I'm hoping that it also is included when it comes out of conference committee okay so what you're what we've just been talking about this this very issue this is something that you're hopeful w will, we will be seeing change in a good way here in Arlington in terms of that funding increasing um, from the state oh, between now and 2027 if this goes through. That's what you're Correct. saying? This is part of that $1.5 billion that's Correct. going to, we hope, well, be... The, yes. The, 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 the impact that we will feel on municipal budgets will be immediate. But the, the investment is between now and 2027, meaning we're going to implement the $1.5 billion investment over a seven-year mm -hmm, process. Mm -hmm. But there is, again, the $2 million that you said we are getting in additional funding this year. Correct. What is, is that, again, is that going to be directed towards special education, for instance, or anything like that? Or is it, it really just general increased funding for our school budget? It's general increased funding. Um, it was done through the Chapter 70 formula we voted on it um, with the budget in April and and the Senate followed suit with the same numbers um, with local aid numbers so it's a tremendous investment um, I know the school committee has strong um, they have strong standards for what they're going to use that money for so I know it's going to be used well mm -hmm. so great good news on education what else coming out of, of the budget uh, do we have to, to point to and say yes? Well, we saw a tremendous increase in investments in nearly every area from mental health, uh, DDS, that's people with disabilities, um, more investment in, in transportation. Uh, so it, all, it was all, a, all issues that I know you have it, been very concerned with and, and active around for, for a long time now. So. Another area that I think is really important is we put a tremendous amount of money in the rainy day fund. And so that's very important to me. You know, in areas of strong uh, fiscal times where our investments can be huge, um, we also need to remember that things are happening at the federal level that may create some concerns here and cause revenues from sales tax to capital gains tax. Um, I don't want to use the word plummet, but to decrease over time. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you may know, you know, I was elected in 2008, and my first budget, things were great. Uh, you know, I got a couple of earmarks for Arlington. My priorities around people with disabilities and mental health uh, were invested tremendously. And then the Senate did the budget in uh, in June, or, or May rather, in the middle of May. And between April and May. The, the, the bank the market collapsed. Mm -hmm. We lost four billion dollars in capital gains and sales tax revenue and it was almost a, 
a different budget when it went from the House to the Senate because we lost 200 earmark e line items got zeroed out. So we need to prepare because when we, there's an economic downturn, we may not receive notice. So that's why we need to make sure that we put enough money in our stabilization accounts mm -hmm. to make sure that we're still able to uh, invest in, in the Commonwealth. I have to say, um, you know, we did discuss this with, um, with your co-legislators as well, and um, I agree with you uh, and them 100% that this is, this is prudent and very important to remember, even as you're, you know, you've been working for years around, you know, establishing different programs, all of which depend on money. Now there's money, I'm sure there's a big temptation. Yes. to say, let's, all right, let's get this done and this done and this yep. done. Really important to remember, let's put some aside because things right. are not always going to be this right. good. And very simple, but very important. Right. And when times are good, you have to pick specific areas to invest. And education is one of those areas. Transportation needs to be one of those areas. You still have to make difficult choices of where you invest, even during good fiscal times, as you just mentioned, James. Mm -hmm. And you just mentioned, Sean, uh, transportation. Yes. So that's something, uh, you know, before we came on camera, we were discussing the fact that, you know, it is not possible for us to have a conversation, uh, but be it legislative update or be it, you know, if I see you on the street somewhere uh, without this coming up, it seems, right. because it's so prevalent in our lives. It's so clearly uh, a problem here in the Boston area, throughout the state. On and on we talk about it. On and on it seems like things are not happening. Right. So at the risk of <laughs> repeating a cycle, uh, let me ask you, anything going on in, in that sphere that, you know, that is, is worth sharing with our audience? So I think it's important to remember that Massachusetts runs on transportation, right? When there is a derailment, as we saw twice this past season, uh, between the red line and the orange line, um, and some technical dif difficulties with the green line, families feel that. You know, we talk about transportation in terms of the economy and how important it is to the economy. That's true. But what I hear every day and what I see every day as someone who works on these issues is how it impacts individuals how it impacts families, right? People being late to work, people getting home from work at seven o'clock, eight o'clock at night um, because the trains were delayed, they didn't run. Depending on the seasons, you could have a situation many times where the air conditioning doesn't work, where there's power outages because we have a transportation system that needs to be invested in and we have a transportation system that literally is just moving at a very, very slow pace. Mm -hmm. It's not the way we can run a 21st century economy. Um, so what can we do about it? And as you know, I've proposed uh, many uh, ideas of how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And for me, the first, there's several things that we can do. Um, the question is, will we uh, have the political will to do it? At, at the state house, and that's the answer I don't have. Mm -hmm. But the proposal that I've been proposing for for many years now is around debt relief. And I know we've talked a yep. lot about this. You're probably sick and tired of hearing me talk about it, James. But you know, it, it needs to be said. We have a 5.3 billion dollar debt on the on MBTA from the big, the big dig, dig yeah. which was when I was a child, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and the reason why it's so important is every dollar that goes in through revenue to the MBTA, 35 cents to 40 cents of that goes right away to pay for debt service. Debt that isn't even the T's. The T wasn't responsible to it. It was around the big dig. But yet, the T has to, to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And that has certainly caused huge problems in our public transportation system. And the reason we need to deal with it is because of we're paying 35 to 40 right. cents on every dollar. But also, I told you it was done when I was a kid. That whole period, it's been ignored. You know, through 
you know, very small revenues to pay down the debt, mm -hmm. but not any big, it hasn't paid it down nearly as much as we should, right? It's been out of sight, out of mind. Unless we deal with this first or with any adequate bill, it will continue to be out of sight, out of mind for the next 50 years. And if we want to invest, I was talking to Sarah a little bit off camera, if we want to invest in transportation improvements across the Commonwealth, we talked about you know, west to east rail, the north-south rail link, things that will uh, revitalize our economy in Massachusetts and make people's lives better because that's what transportation is supposed to do. Mm -hmm. We can't do that unless we deal with this essential problem and that is the debt. We need to pay down the debt so we can take that money and put it to where it should be, investing in families by investing in public transportation in Massachusetts. So that's one thing we need to do. Mm -hmm. The second thing that we need to do or, or look at certainly is around uh, more direct revenue for the MBTA, for the RTAs, for public transportation across the Commonwealth. Though I represent Arlington and Medford, I look at transportation not just uh, as silos of how we can benefit here in the Boston area, but how important it is to invest in transportation across the Commonwealth, across our state, because that makes our economy better. That makes our people's lives better. So um, I'm under the impression and believe that the legislature will be taking up a revenue bill directly targeted to public transportation um, probably after um, our, our recess around the holidays. Mm -hmm. So I would expect that we will take it up in the month of January. So what form might that take? When you say a revenue bill, that means more money is going to come in somehow. What, what, what should people or could people expect um, are going to be the sources for that additional revenue? So right now, I don't know. I've been meeting with Speaker DeLeo and my colleagues and certainly arguing that I believe any revenue increase needs to be progressive and needs to be adequate. I've been um, arguing my support for closing some corporate tax loopholes, looking at the expenditure budget, trying to find ways to make sure if we do um, revenue that it's adequate, meaning that if we do this, it's going to meet the needs of the problems that we're facing. Mm -hmm but to make sure it's not going to hurt working families, that we do it in a progressive way, meaning that um, we're increasing taxes, if you will, on those who can afford it, not working families here in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. So there, that's what I've been arguing. I can't give you an exact answer because the bill is not public and that I haven't seen it yet either. Mm -hmm. The Joint Committee on Revenue is working with the chair of the Joint Committee on Transportation and the Speaker and the Senate President are working to craft a bill, hopefully, that will adequately increase our revenues to be directly for transportation so we can do serious upgrades and improvements in our public transportation system across the Commonwealth. Let me, let me ask you something, Sean. You mentioned at the beginning of this conversation about transportation, or the beginning of the part of the conversation about that, you said, you know, if there's the political will. And that really is the 64,000, the 64 million, the 64 billion, I don't know, yep. dollar question, right? And so I'm confused a little bit, I have to say. Looks to me like we have a legislature in the state house, Democrat, do, you know, democratically dominated or dominated by the Democratic Party. Um, the legislators that I get to talk to, there's only three of them, but then I also interact with others, hear about others' views on this, etc. It looks like there's plenty of consensus. Who, who is stand, standing in the way mm -hmm. of the establishment of political will? What are the interests that are, that are there, present in the State House, that are, that are countering? this, you know, your clear conviction about what's needed, as well as Cindy Friedman's, as well as Dave Rogers, as well as many others. Right. Um, so what, what is it? What, what makes it so hard to find that political will that you're talking about when it looks like there's 
you know, broad consensus about around this. Several years ago, we did another transportation bill, and the proposal came up with around five hundred million dollars. Certainly inadequate, and it was certainly done in a regressive way. And this increased uh, the the gas tax three cents, increased the um, taxes on some tobacco products, and it just got us to five hundred million. Okay. There were a number of legislators who were strongly opposed to it because it was an increase in taxes. And I remember being in the Speaker's office arguing for a more progressive form of revenue, having colleagues in different parts of the state saying, absolutely not, I will lose my re-election, I can't vote for that. And I said, well then we're lying to the people of Massachusetts. Because if we're going to do a $500 million revenue plan, which is in fact regressive and inadequate, the problem isn't going to get fixed. And so five years from now, when we're in the same situation, your constituents are going to come to you and say, we just did this. What happened? It's because not even the political will, you didn't tell your constituents the truth of what the magnitude of the problem is and how we need to fix it. And so. You know, I don't want to blame my colleagues, um, but I can tell you that there's a lot of people on Beacon Hill who hear the word revenue or taxes um, and get concerned. And maybe it's easy for me to say because I represent constituents that understand that we need revenue to deliver a product to our constituents that we can be proud of, that uh, improves the quality of life for the people here in Arlington and Medford and across the Commonwealth. Um, but. I voted no on the revenue bill a number of years ago because it was inadequate, mm -hmm. because it was regressive. And I hope I don't have to do that again. Um, we need revenue, and I'd like to make sure it's done in a, regressive, in a progressive way, but also make sure it's adequate. But a lot of that is about finding the political will, and a lot of that is convincing my colleagues that the time is right to do it. Okay. Well, I appreciate the fact that you, you know, you, of course, you can't bash your colleagues, but it, you know, I think that our audience is hungry for, as am I, frankly, um, you know, some straight talk about why this is not getting done. Right. And so, appreciate your your addressing that. Um, let me ask you. Let's 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 keep moving forward. Um, what are because we are here for a legislative update. Give us an update on some of the legislation that you're either sponsoring, particularly interested in, et cetera you know, that, that folks should know about. Great. Um, so this session I filed around 65 pieces of legislation. I'm not going to talk about all 65, James, I promise. Yes, you can, but you can talk <laughs> about one uh, thirtieth of those, okay? Or but one they're, uh, they're in the areas, <laughs> everything from people with disabilities, to kids with mental health, renewable energy. Um, there are a whole host of issues that I believe um, really strengthen the core of my mission as your state representative and that is investing in the people of Massachusetts. That you know I wake up every day and try to file and work on pieces of legislation that I believe make us stronger, that I believe support the most vulnerable people in the Commonwealth. So to give you an example of two of the bills or three of those bills that I think are really close to the finish line, mm -hmm. meaning that we're doing the work, the legislative work with my colleagues, with advocacy groups and really trying to perfect these pieces of legislation to be able to kind of get them through. One is I call the Inclusive Concurrent Enrollment Bill. So, and I've talked about this bill before, and this is a piece of legislation that will allow students with autism and Down syndrome to be able to go to college even if they can't pass the MCAS test. So we would remove the barrier of the MCAS test. And the reason we want to do this, any study that has been conducted shows that students with autism and Down syndrome and other IDDs they are 35% more likely to be successful in terms of uh, you know, independence, employment, if they're able to go on to college. To me, this is a, a true mission. You know, people battled for generations of inclusion, making sure these students were included in K through 12 classroom. Now, no one even blinks an eye because it's the way it is, mm -hmm. but it hasn't always been that way. We are at the forefront of this battle in public higher education, and I'm really confident that this session we're able, we're going to be able to get it done. 
The second bill that is really, really close is around people who have multiple sclerosis. There are thousands and thousands of people who live, I don't want to use the word suffer, but they, mm -hmm. they live mm -hmm. with this disease every single day and they're able to deal with it through uh, prescription drugs. Many times health insurance companies will drop a drug that is working for people. And when that happens, it causes flare-ups, it causes very much discomfort that may even lead that individual as they're trying to find other medication that will work for their, to address their flare-ups to go into the emergency room. This bill would mandate insurance companies cover that prescription drug. And I bring that up because it's very, very close of being able to get passed. And the third bill, it was, I, I believe, is one of my most ambitious pieces of legislation. We just had the hearing for it about a month ago. And this would move Massachusetts to 100% renewable energy by 2045 in all sectors, but also move us by 2035 and 100% renewable energy in the area of utilities. And to me, this is all about political will. We talked about as well. Mm -hmm. I had 40, around 35, 40 of my colleagues, including Rep. Rogers, standing behind me as I testified with my co-filers, Marjorie Decker in the House and Senator Jamie Eldridge in the Senate, that we need to pass this bill, that climate change, we have a moral climate change, obviously, is real, despite what we hear from Washington. Mm -hmm. um, but we have a moral obligation to address it, and this bill um, is going through the legislative process and I'm confident California has done it, New Mexico has done it, Hawaii has done it, New York has done a version of it and we're hopeful that Massachusetts will become the next state to pledge to move to 100% renewable energy by 2045. So you just mentioned Washington mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to ask you um, Right now on the national level we're seeing within the Democratic Party in the field of candidates um, that is going to be windowed down to one um, in, over the coming months, a certain kind of tension, a tension between activism often favored by uh, younger voters um, and uh, you know, activism and change. Let's, let's get something done versus others who would counsel that you, know, you need to take a more moderate approach um, in order to appeal to the electric, electorate, et cetera. I know you're very familiar, as, our, as is our audience, with all these arguments. I'm wondering, though, how does that, how does that tension, how do you deal with the, that kind of tension between let's get something done, let's make big change, and you know, not let's stay the course, but let's do things more incrementally and, and, and more in the in middle of the road. So you're, you're a Democrat, you're serving in the state legislature, how do you deal with that? Right. Well, it's, it's a great question. You know, I'm, I'm guided by my work, everything I do, by certain principles. And part of those principles is making sure we invest in the most vulnerable in the Commonwealth, the most vulnerable in our community, and that is the poor, people who suffer with mental illness, or live with mental illness, sort of, uh, as well, and, and people with disabilities. And everything we do, I look through that lens, okay? I believe in bold change. I believe that everything I work on needs to be bold, it needs to be inventive, and we need to keep pushing for the things we care about. And that's things like single payer, 100% renewable energy, the Cherish Act, which is a bill I filed around investing $500 million in education, public higher education, because it's going to get back and support the students who are able to invest in the Commonwealth after that. So I believe in bold, progressive change. That's why I'm supporting Elizabeth Warren for president. That's why I'm really uh, pushing forward um, on a lot of these agenda items. However, I have never opposed the idea of working as hard as I can to get bold change, but then being able to get something done that I can push forward. Mm -hmm. And a couple examples of that is I support single payer. I support moving in that direction. However, I worked really hard to get hearing aids for children covered. And some people would push back and say, that's not bold enough. That's just one piece of health care. And I don't disagree with that. But for those kids, they've been living for seven years without having to face over $10,000 out of pocket in costs for those kids' hearing aids. To me, that's really, really important. 
I believe in eliminating mandatory sentencing because to me that's really, really important in criminal justice reform. But last session I was able to get past restorative justice becoming the law of the land across the state. And that's really, really important because that one responsible party's life could be changed, not having a permanent record because they go through restorative justice. Their life may be better now because of that. And some people might call that incremental change. So I believe in bold change, but I also believe in the small change to improve people's lives. And I will work at both because I think it's really, really important. And I think that's incumbent on, on, in government. Republicans and Democrats, unenrolled, Green Party, you name the party, that we work to invest in our commonwealth with bold change, but we're also not going to be opposed to supporting people by getting small things done too that will make a big difference in families' lives. And that's how I look at that. Yep, appreciate that answer. Um, before we dig down into a couple of local Arlington issues to, to conclude, I wanted just to ask you to make sure that we are not leaving something unmentioned um, on, the, on the state level in terms of your work in, in the state house, et cetera. Anything that we haven't covered that you wanted to, that you wanted to remind people of? I, I mentioned it a, a little bit in your, your last question uh, as an example of bold change, but I didn't mention it in the legislation I filed this session. And so I just want to talk about it a little bit, and that is the CHERISH Act. So the Mass Teachers Association really worked on two pieces of legislation, one being the Promise Act, with mo which morphed into the Student Opportunity Act, which is that $1.5 billion mm -hmm. investment I mentioned. They also filed the CHERISH Act, which is the other portion of their platform, which is around investing in the 29 public higher education campuses from Cape Cod, Middlesex, all the way out to Berkshire Community College in all sectors, community colleges, state universities, and all of our UMasses. And that is a bill that I have filed um, in the House along with Paul Mark, and uh, who's another rep from uh, Peru, Massachusetts, and uh, Senator Comerford, who represents the Amherst area. And it's around investing about $500 million in public higher education in students and holding fees and tuition flat mm. for the next few years. To me, that is bold change. It's change that we need to see happen. And now that this first year of the legislative session we did K through 12, I'm really hoping, and I, I have every reason to suspect, that the last session, you know, we go until July 31st, will be about public higher education and trying to get my, the bill I filed, the Cherish Act, passed. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You bet. Um, so, in, to conclude, uh, kind of bringing the scale back down to Arlington, um, one of the, we have lots of concerns in town as, as always, um, but you know, it was a, 2019 has been a year of, of some major decisions um, coming forth in town and, and we know that we're going to be uh, funding and getting a new high school and, um, and the override passed as well, et cetera. Big, Big changes in a lot of ways, and 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 a broad acceptance of the reality that we need, that that we need to cough, cough thing, yep. you know, cough up some more money in our through our property taxes, et cetera. However, um, housing itself uh, is a perpetual issue in town. Um, whether it is the burden on uh, homeowners and the uh, and the rise in their property taxes or whether it is the lack, relative lack, um, or at least the, 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 the fact that the level, the, the, the uh, supply of affordable housing in town is lower than many, many people are comfortable with mm -hmm. or wanting. Um, what, how do you see that playing out in town? Right. And specifically, um, you know, again, the, the Mugar development um, is one that has been uh, on everybody's radar for multiple years. Um, it may be moving forward, it seems. Um, uh, there is an, uh, there are, there's affordable housing that's gonna be part of that development. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, yet most of the town uh, seems opposed and virtually all of the local officials we've spoken to are opposed to that development. Isn't it a good idea to get a little bit more affordable housing in here? Well, I think it would be how you would define affordable. 
Um, I certainly wouldn't define affordable that is used under general law as affordable. Um, I certainly couldn't afford it. Many of my peers couldn't afford it. And that's the problem, right? When we hear affordable housing, we think, oh, this is great. This means that the average middle class family will be able to afford this unit. Um, but that's not true. Uh, it could be anywhere from $2,500 to $3,000 a month for a one bedroom unit. To me, that is not the definition. Really? So that of affordable. fits under the state's definition of what affordable it housing is? It, it does. Huh. And so that's certainly something that um, I think that we have to look strongly at and whether or not that's affordable, but that's also a state issue. And I, I think when we do zoning reform and we'll be taking that up, we'll be looking at items like rent control. I'm not saying that that's going to be part of the bill or part of the solution, but that does need to be part of the process of investigating what we can do to support um, communities because it's not just isolated to Arlington, it's impacting the whole Boston area in terms of uh, housing market. And I, you know, I do support zoning reform, um, you know, depending what the details are to help grow more housing opportunities in Arlington, but I also think it's important that we have a, a conversation in terms of what is affordable and what, what the definition of affordable should be um, for a lot of these markets. In terms of the Mugar property, the decision recently looks like the project is, is moving forward. I have been categorically opposed to this project. It's not that I'm opposed to affordable housing. Obviously, I'm for affordable housing. I've been working closely with the Arlington Housing Corporation the economic development here in Arlington um, and Arlington Housing Authority itself to try to come up with more units of housing to make it affordable, to make Arlington an affordable place to live. But if you look at that region um, of where uh, Mr. Mugar, where they, he wants to place that over 100 unit mm -hmm. development. I think it's over 200 yeah. units even. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a tremendous, it's a huge build. That unit from, or that that development area where what used to be the silver maple forest right what used to be the say the faces property what used to be lanes and games has just built about it is. 800 units of housing mm -hmm. that has an environmental impact because that is was conservation land um, and that means you know flooding that means more traffic that means a whole crunch area to that region um, that I don't believe is sustainable. And so um, to me, there, it, it raises a lot of questions in terms of um, the viability of that area mm -hmm. with the increase of sewerage, traffic. Over, you know, it just it raises a lot of concerns. So that's why I have been opposed to that. I think it's clear now, um, so I, I don't want to speak out of turn because it's not my legislative district. That area is supported by Representative Rogers and Senator Friedman, so I will support them in any way they want my support. But I myself have has always been opposed to developing that area. Um, you know, with that said, with the project seeming to move forward, I think the town has, uh, you know, a difficult choice to enter conversations with the developer on, on what, what are the proposals. Mm -hmm. um, but I've always been opposed to it. Right. Yeah, and like you said, the town is in a tough situation. Would you do? You, do you see that we that we as a town do have some potential leverage with the developer to try and, like you said, begin to talk about how this is all going to play out and whether we can um, extract, let's say, some concessions or some some uh, you know something that works for the town in your eyes and in the eyes of, of others, uh, is this, do we still have that option, do you think? I hope so. I hope so. Mm -hmm. Because it really, really is important, not just for this region of Arlington, but for the whole community. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that whatever gets built, if anything, is going to support the mission of Arlington, not hinder it. Um, but that's probably a question for, for our town attorney, our town manager, our, our select board. Um, who will have to start answering these these questions. You know, this has been a project that um, has been proposed, obviously not this iteration, but there's been several iterations and decades apart. 
you know, the Mugar family has owned this property for decades. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so I'm really hopeful that we're going to be able to reach a, a consensus that is not going to damage the neighborhoods in East Arlington or our environment. All right. Well, thank you, Sean. Thank you, James. Uh, really, uh, on behalf of our audience, um, really do appreciate you always taking the time to come by Great. and share with us. And um, today, I, I, feel, I, I found to be a particularly kind of, it's usual broad range uh, in terms of our conversation, but also some, some real straight talk, uh, you know, in terms of me asking questions, uh, but also in terms of your responses in a way that, again, given the fact that we're dealing with some seemingly intractable problems that we continue to talk about right. all the time, um, it, it is helpful, I think, for all of us uh, out right. here, um, your constituents, uh, to hear, um, you know, again, some straight talk from you about, hey, this is what we're up against, this right. is what we can expect, this is what we can hope for, um, and so again, we appreciate that. Well, I, I appreciate your questions, and I, I appreciate ACMI always inviting me back here. So, <laughs> and we will thank continue you. to do so. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you. For our state representative, Sean Garbley, who, uh, let's remind everybody, yes, represents Arlington, but also West Medford. Um, I'm James Milan. This is Talk of the Town. We appreciate your being here.